Good morning. Welcome to St. James. If you would please stand for the procession with the cross. Our opening hymn is hymn 837, Lift High the Cross, verses 1 through 4. St. James Lutheran Church of Imperial Beach. Glad you're here today. Glad for those who are tuning in. Please send us an email. We'll get you the uh, bulletin. Our order of service uh, will begin on page 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, o Lord hear, my hear my voice. voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And with this you may kneel, or if you like, uh, be seated.
Most merciful and gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you. We confess our sins of thought, of word, and of deed, some of which is known to us, some of which is unknown to us. Sadly, we have disobeyed your righteous teaching, and we are truly sorry and ask for your forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. Hymn 349, Hark the Glad Sound, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Good morning. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament, from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, from chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophecy over these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, as was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling of the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and the flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, thus said the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. 
when I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will pray, place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, whom for his whom for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Our second reading is from the New Testament, from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, from chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. St. Paul writes us, there is, no, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what, what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Now we'll have our children chat. Anyone would like to come up. Well, to, today uh, we have in our gospel reading, we have a story, Mary and Martha, they were two sisters and they had a brother named Lazarus. And they lived uh, not too far away from Jerusalem, outside in the outskirts of town. And uh, the brother became very sick. And the brother, he, he uh, became so sick that he died. Jesus, though, when he came, <clears throat> without all the detail, he, uh, when he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And um, Jesus comes, and the one sister, Martha, she said, well, if you'd been here, you could have done something, but now it's too late, he's already dead. And the other sister was all shaken up about it, and <clears throat> Mary, and even Jesus, when he went over to the area, he, he wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible, and uh, showed his great emotion for the situation. It really affected him, too, because Lazarus was his friend, along with uh, Mary and Martha. And, but uh, he said, you know, uh, do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? Well, of course, you know, at the end of times, you're going to raise everyone up. We know that. He goes, no, I mean, do you believe I'm the resurrection of life now? Well, yeah. So he went over to the tomb, and he said, all right, now just open up the tomb. And uh, he said, no, don't do that. 
You know, it's been four days. You know what, after four days, it's not going to be very pleasant. Jesus said, open the tomb. Okay. Now, this part here, I'll, I'm not going to do as loud as maybe Jesus did it. <laughs> okay. And so Jesus, after he, he's, he yelled, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was laughing and so happy. <laughs> you know, we got to be careful here. Not, not too scary, Fred. <laughs> all right. Lazarus came out of the tomb all wrapped up. And you did a good job, Lazarus, getting yourself wrapped up. And then he said, unwrap that man. I don't know if I can do this. Let's see here. All right. <laughs> and he was alive. Thank you, Jesus. After four days, he was alive. And and he said, Mabuhai, como esta cayo? Yeah, that's yeah. I'm talking in Filipino and Tagalog. And he says, I'm doing fine. Yeah, doing fine. I, I don't stink. I, I put on deodorant today. Yeah, all right. He put on deodorant. And they went and had lunch together after that. So he wasn't just raised, you know, like spiritually or something. He's raised alive where he's eating food, eating lunch. I'll bet he had some wonderful stories about heaven, what it was like up there. Yeah, was, but was, we don't have them. But I'm glad to be alive. Thank you. But it was pointing to the future. Jesus has the power over death and the grave. And uh, he will, you know, we're getting closer to Good Friday when he gives his life. But we also know the rest of the story, don't we? We do. Yes, we do, and that's what's so exciting. Go ahead. He is risen indeed. We're going to be saying that. Oh, yeah, we're going to be saying that. Not too soon yet. Yeah, right. All right, Lazarus. And so Christ is our Savior, not only from sin, but death and the grave. It's wonderful to know that. Thank you, Lazarus, for helping us understand that. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing it up. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who not only gave his life for us on the cross, but we know he's a living Savior. He rose again. Thank you for this. Keep all the children and all of us together in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel reading has been shortened. We're starting at page, uh, verse 17. The gospel reading is from John, verse 17 through 45. Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again, Martha said to him. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me through, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but it was still in the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also keep, have kept this man from dying? When Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and the stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that I, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up this, his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he... When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now we'll confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. And we begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hymn 855, For All the Faithful Women, verses 1, 9, 11, and 3.
Well, dear friends in Christ, we're on the fifth Sunday of Lent, and during Lent, uh, we reflect on our lives to see if there might be any way within us that might be offensive to the Lord. But the question is, uh, what is this mirror in which we reflect our lives? Or what is the standard by which we measure our lives to see if we fall short of the glory of God? The psalmist says in the first two verses of, of the first psalm, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, law he meditates day and night. You find that the law of the Lord is a delight to the believer. Those who are living, as Paul said, those who live according to the Spirit. They delight in God's law because it's a blessing for them. And I want you to be blessed today. So we're going to talk about God's law, about the Ten Commandments. I thought it would be time to have a little review. But before we do, we want to look at the context and a little bit of the backstory as we lead up to the Ten Commandments because it may have been, it may have been a little while uh, since you thought about it. When we uh, look here, we see the verse in Exodus 19.1. On the third new moon, after the people Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. This is where we start leading into the story where they're at Mount Sinai and they're going to receive the Ten Commandments. But what is this about three, you know, cycles of the moon after? It's talking about in the last three months since the time of the Passover. Let me explain what's happened here. As you'll remember, Jacob, they were suffering a famine 430 years previous to this. And so uh, Joseph, you remember the whole story, he uh, invites his family. Joseph, who had been sold into slavery, had become the prime minister of Egypt. He invites his family in, 70 in all. They come and settle in Goshen in the land there. After Joseph is gone, they don't remember the reason why those people are here and they're multiplying and pretty soon uh, the Pharaoh enslaves uh, Joseph's family, Jacob's family, which are known as the Israelites. And they live in slavery for 400 years. If you remember the story, then Moses is raised up. Uh, he starts off as, uh, as some say, a basket case in the Nile. And the, but the Lord can use him. You remember, he's trying to save, his mother saves his life by putting him in the basket, and then he's raised as a prince of Egypt. And then uh, he, he got involved in a, a situation where he murders a man, he escapes, uh, he's 40 years old, and he goes back and lives in the wilderness, way out uh, in the wilderness for 40 years. He married a woman there named Zipporah, and... Uh, he just thinks he's a shepherd from then on until he talks to a burning bush one day. And uh, he's told, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. Let my people go. And so he, he goes. And now you remember there were ten plagues that lead up to this. And the tenth one is Passover. And Passover then is where the death angel passes over the homes who had killed the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost of, of their homes. That was in Nisan, the month of Nisan, or Nisan, and that is our month of around March, April. So about this time of year is when this happens, at about 1,450 B.C. So we're talking approximately uh, 3,500 years ago, in about this time of year. And the people are then told that the Egyptians are so fearful now of the Israelites, they say, go, and they leave, and then they get up to the Red Sea, remember, and they've crossed the Red Sea now on dry ground. They saw the Egyptian army, you know, swallowed up and drowned by the Red Sea. They're on the other side now. They've had the experience when they get out there in the desert of Sinai. There's no water. They find this pool of water. They're, oh, finally, we find a pool of water. It's bitter water. They can't drink it. 
And then the Lord tells Moses to throw a log in it, and it changes it to sweet water. Now they can drink it. And the Lord says, I'm testing the people to see if they will follow my commandments. Then they get a little further, and uh, they don't have water, and the Lord produces water from a rock for them. And the Lord, again, he's testing them. Are you going to follow my ways? Are you going to trust me through this, through this time as we go towards the promised land? Then they're getting hungry. And the Lord provides for them this bread from heaven that we call manna. They've been living now on water from this rock and about two weeks or so on the manna from heaven. They arrive now at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is out there. It's uh, between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. It's uh, south of Israel. If you're trying to locate it, it's uh, north of the of the Red Sea. It's a place, if you want to see it today, you can fly there and take a bus. And you can arrive at St. Catherine's Monastery, which is built at the foot of the mountain. And as far as surveys go, they believe that's <coughs> approximately about where it happened, as best as they can tell. There's a mountain range there. The mountain's about 7,500 feet high. And the people camp there, and then the Lord descends on it with smoke and fire, and lightning, and peals of thunder. The Lord tells Moses, tell the people, don't go near that mountain, don't go up on the mountain, have archers ready to shoot them down if they come to the mountain. The Lord is now getting ready to give to them the law, to teach them his ways, that they might walk according uh, to the Spirit. And he gives them these commandments and he writes them on tablets of stone, two tablets of stone. Interesting, just a, a thought on this. Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. In Egypt, they wrote with hieroglyphics. Here, they're going to have it written for them in Hebrew. And Moses can read and write Hebrew. As, as at this time, there is no Bible. There are no first five books of the Bible. There's no Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the Lord is writing the first pages, and he's writing it on stone and giving it to Moses to give to the people. Moses and Aaron can both read, and the sons of Aaron can read. So there is an active, there have been some kind of active teaching going on there among the slaves where they learn to read and, and write, at least some of them. And so they receive the scriptures, and when they read them, Moses can read this in his language, and he can then teach it to the people who can and understand it. But at this point, they don't have all the history straight, but they do have some of it uh, in the background because we know that when they left from, <clears throat> when they left from Egypt, they took the bones of, of Joseph with them. Joseph had died 400 years earlier, and they remembered the words of Joseph, how he made them promise that when they returned to the promised land, they would take his bones with them. And so whether they wrote that down to remember it, or they were passing along by tradition to remember for over a period of 400 years about the, what they had promised to Joseph to bring him back to the promised land, to bring his bones there. And then the Lord gave them the commandments. Now there's part of the story where, you know, they had the golden calf. And they had started disobeying the Lord. And Moses came down and he smashed the first set of Ten Commandments. And uh, then he ground up the gold idol and they drank the water that had the dust of the idol in it to show them that that God is nothing. The true God all these miracles that they've seen, crossing the Red Sea and the plagues before that, and then here at the mountain and the rumblings and the peals of thunder and all this going on, trust in him. Trust him. He gives you his commandment. These are the standard by which we measure our lives. These are the, the mirror in which we reflect to see our lives. Are they what the Lord wants them to be. Are we living according to the flesh or are we living according to the Spirit? 
No human being can set that standard. You hear people say, oh, that's not right, and that's wrong, and these kinds of things. You go, but what's your standard? Is it just because you think so, or is it because some uh, group of people voted on it or something like that? No, we need it to come from God himself. He is our creator. I mention it sometimes. You want to know how a car works? You open up the manufacturer's uh, book, the manual, and you say, oh, here it is. If you want it to run right, you put gasoline in the tank, you put oil in the crankcase, transmission fluid in the transmission. It tells you how, to, how things are to work. This is the manufacturer's instruction. God's our creator, our manufacturer. He says, this is the best way for you to live. I'm going to bless you if, you if you keep these commandments. But if you don't, as he warned the people of Israel, I will bring the plagues of Egypt on you. And so he was a little bit of the of the uh, carrot and the stick, I guess you could say there, for them to try to teach them. And so the Lord gives us these commandments, which are a blessing to us, those who know Christ as their Savior, because these commandments are not meant to take away your sins. These commandments, you can't keep them perfectly. We know that. We're just humans. Uh, we, we do something what we call sin. And I think here at church is the only place you're going to hear about sin. I, I don't know when you go to the grocery store or hear on the news or anything, does anybody talk about sin anymore? I, I don't think so, at least not much. But here at church, we hear about sin, how we offended God. And the Ten Commandments, yes, they, they tell us that, but for those who know Christ and the forgiveness of sins, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, these, these commandments are a real blessing. You can look into the mirror here and see that they're a guide for our lives as we follow Jesus Christ. And so our commandments, we have ten of them. Uh, we call them two tables of the law. It isn't, the two tables don't match perhaps the two tablets. When we talk two tables, we have commandments that are those for God and then the commandments that are for our neighbor. The first three commandments are the first table of the law. The first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. It is the most important commandment because he's the one who gives us all the other commandments. They all come from him. You, you need to know God first. You shall have no other God before me. And you can think of it as, you know, the golden calf, or it could be money, or it can be position or power, whatever's most important to you. That becomes your God. Well, we want the God of the Bible to be our God. And he says, you shall have no other God before me. Second one, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now to help you remember this a little bit, your first commandment is number one. Who's number one? God is number one. Who's up there? God is up there. You shall have no other God. There's nothing before one is zero, right? Anything you do beyond, you know, before that, that's all negative. So we want, you shall have no other God before me. He's number one. Number two, V for vain. You should not take the Lord's name in vain. And so we don't misuse his name. We use it in good ways, like when we sing the hymns and we praise God and we pray to him. That's the good use of God's name. But if you use his name to cover a lie, well, you're breaking that commandment. Uh, you don't want to say, oh, I swear to God, this is the best uh, Cadillac ever. And when you're trying to sell it to someone, you know the transmission's about to fall out of it. You see, that, that's covering up a lie because you know it's a different situation. And the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And so the Lord is encouraging us to have time to go to church, to hear his word, and to be blessed by hearing his word and the message of salvation. And so we have those three. Those are dedicated first to God. No other God, not use his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to worship our God. Now, you have commandments 4 through uh, 10. And 4 through 10, they relate to our neighbor. How do I take care of my neighbor? And these things are a real blessing to us. The first one on that list is number 4, honor your father and mother. Parents are second only to God. You notice that. God, these are not just randomly thrown together. But God put number 4 right after the commandments concerning himself to honor father and mother. Father and mother are very important. It's also a positive commandment. 
Each of the commandments have a positive side and a negative side. One side telling you not to do something. The positive side is to do something positive. So honor your father and mother. Okay, you bring your mother a bouquet of flowers. See, that would be the positive thing where you're honoring them. Your mother tells you to clean up your room. You clean up your room. That's honoring her. Dishonoring is when you make your parents angry at you. You do things that anger them. And so there you have the negative side and the positive side. But this commandment starts off positive. Honor your father and mother. And it's the commandment, Jesus says, has a promise connected to it that, you're, that it may go well with you and your days may be long on the earth. The Lord will bless you with a better life and a longer life if you honor your father and your mother. That's a wonderful promise that he gives. He says, I, I want to just reinforce this commandment to you. I put it number one on the list. Number one neighbor, your parents. Another thing about it, I will bless you if you do this. I give you a, sp a specific uh, promise with this. It's a wonderful thing to know. You see Jesus himself. He's God on earth. But he says he submitted himself. Remember he's in the temple. And he goes with his parents back to Nazareth. Says he submitted to Mary and Joseph. So when Father said sweep up the sawdust off the floor in the carpenter shop, he did it. When his mother said clean up your room, he did it. He honored his parents. Even though they were mere humans and he's God in human flesh, he set that example for us. Fifth commandment, this also is a blessing to us. Thou shalt not kill. The Lord is trying to protect our lives, not to kill each other. That we don't run around and just murder and mayhem on, on people. Now we know there's exceptions, and I talked about this before. You know, sometimes uh, maybe you're an executioner and you have to carry that out. Well, as long as you're doing it under the law, you're carrying out your, your duty. Or if you're in the military, you have to go out and defend the country. Yes, you have to use uh, force and violence to accomplish those goals. And that's part of it. So thou shalt not kill. We're protecting innocent life. And then at times we have to take life when you have not so innocent or someone's trying to harm us. And so you have, maybe we want to say thou shalt not murder. But we also have to be careful because there's some things in society that are legal that are not right. The government makes it legal, but it's still not the right thing to do. And so, for example, uh, murder would be one of those of the, of the innocent. And so you have the abortion issue. And so there it's legal, but it's still not right. And so the Christian says, no, I'm not going to participate in doing that because that's not the right thing to do. It's against God's law. Then you have the, the sixth commandment. You shall, uh, well, you shall not commit adultery. This is to protect marriages. That's a wonderful thing, that God wants your marriage protected. Uh, husband and wife, uh, man and woman. See, that's another issue. It's man and woman. And for until death do us part is, is God's plan for us. And uh, so... Husbands and wives do what they can to make their marriage as happy as they possibly can. And uh, so they can enjoy that marriage and they have a home where if the Lord blesses, they can raise children and have a family. And that, again, is a, is a blessing from the Lord. And it avoids all kinds of problems because also it uh, is saying no premarital sex and no sex outside of marriage. It will prevent, prevent lots of uh, unwanted diseases and things like that that are... It's a blessing to us. So the Lord's not trying to take the fun out of life. He's trying to make it so that things work best in life. And then the seventh commandment, you should not steal. That also helps us protect our property. It lets us know that you're allowed to own property and that uh, others should respect it and not be taking it, nor should you take other people's property. And on the positive side, if you see someone's property that might be at risk of being stolen, that you would try to help them. So if they leave their garage door open, you say, oh, hey, Joe, you left your garage door open. You might want to close it. Yeah, because you don't want someone stealing your tools or something like that. And so you're looking out for other people. Or you see a senior who might be taken advantage of by a, a, a contractor who's trying to, you know, rip them off. And you step in and say, you know what? You know what, Granny? I think somebody's uh, trying to rip you off here. And you help, help them out. 
They used to protect them. And that seventh commandment is, again, another, another blessing. Uh, number eight, you know, you shall give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. It starts in the court. When you go to court, you tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. You don't lie. If it's not to your advantage or to a family member's advantage, you still tell the truth. We always tell the truth. We don't spread gossip. Instead, we try to put the best construction on people's lives, the best motives that we can put on their lives, rather than trying to think of, oh, a, a, a bad story we might want to say about them. No, it, it protects us against gossip, protects us against lying, and especially at the court level where someone can take away your life, your property, your family. Uh, so it's very, very important. Number nine and ten are very much related. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And uh, again, that's protecting, you know, not having thoughts about you know, not being satisfied. You're coveting, you're envious, you're jealous of someone else's house and their possession. And uh, you start maybe scheming about how you might steal them. So don't even think about it. Take it out of your mind. Don't even think about it. And shall not covet your neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't even think about committing adultery. Don't even think about enticing someone away from their home. Don't even think about enticing someone away from their, their job. You might take advantage of, of the uh, other employer. Don't do that. Don't even think about it. So even our thoughts, our words, and our deeds as we confess. We confess that we are sinners because we, we look at the list of the commandments. We go, yeah, God set a standard, and I fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> Paul tells us that in Romans 3.23. We all fall short. We're all sinners. We're humans. And that's our condition. We're born into sin and we sin. And uh, the mirror shows us that we fall short too. But we're not saved by the mirror. I, I say this sometimes. You look in the mirror in the morning and you see, oh, I got all this stubble on my face. I guess I'm going to need, need to shave. Well, you're not sha you don't shave by the mirror. You're saved by grace. You see, we're saved by God's grace. Paul wrote in Romans 8, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So, we can't accomplish it on our own. We're sinners. And we just admit it. And we ask Christ to forgive us for that. He took the punishment. He took the shame. Don't think you can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly and that you'll get into heaven that way. No. When you look in the mirror, you go, yeah, I fall short of the glory of God. I need Jesus Christ. But as a Christian, one who knows the forgiveness of their sins, that the righteousness that you have in your life is not your own, but has come through Jesus Christ, as Paul writes here. It's a righteousness that comes from outside to us and on us and for us. Well, we want to live according to that. How do we do that? What's the guide for our lives? It's these Ten Commandments. They're a wonderful blessing given, given to us that we can follow them and live by them. And uh, at this time of Lent, uh, we, we have the color purple. Remember the... Yeah, yeah, the darkness of sin and how Christ had to go to the cross for us. And we're so thankful that he did that for us. We're getting close to Good Friday when we contemplate how Christ hung there on the cross and became sin for us. As he became a curse for us. Can you imagine that? Galatians chapter 3 becomes a curse for us. That we might have the righteousness of him put upon us into our account. But now as Christians, we want to live according to these commandments. We want to live by them. He gave them to us. And it will be a blessing to you. Do things God's way. I always encourage that. Do things God's way. There might be other ways you think are easier, uh, but do it God's way. And if it turns out that it's, you know, like a Joseph who gets uh, wrongfully accused and gets thrown into jail, remember that? He gets uh, falsely accused and he finds himself in prison. Yeah, he's, 
you know, someone might say, well, I should have just lied or something. No. He told the truth. He did what was right. And God blessed him. He went through a hard time for a while, but God blessed him. Do things God's way. Follow his ways. You might go through a hard time doing it, but then you'll know, I please God. And that's most important of all. Because at the end of time, he's the one that matters. He's the one I'll meet at the end. He's the one I give account to. And he's the one I love because he didn't hold any with good thing for me, not even his only son, to be my savior. And may the peace of Christ, which passes our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in him to everlasting life. If you're not worshiping here in person, you are able to make your tithes and offerings online. And while the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings, we'll sing hymn 770, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. each and every day of our lives. In the name of your loving Son, we pray. Amen. And we have a few announcements. Right, I just want to, good morning everyone, I just want to do a quick recap of Easter. Um, please get the word out, um, Faye has stuff on all our web, uh, websites, Teresa has sent attachments so you can print things out. If you would like a, a flyer, please um, just pick one up from the back, but just get the word out that there's um, sunrise service down at the pier, there's regular service here at 11 o'clock, and there's a free breakfast at 9.30. Um, just a quick 
going over everything. We're still doing Easter eggs. Please bring empty Easter eggs. Please bring chocolates, or you can put them together and leave them in the nursery. Um, either way, we're collecting all those. Um, we still need a lot of signing up for help. On the Saturday before, we will be staging. So if you have any will to help us out. We've got to get all the chairs on the racks. We are actually putting them in trucks that night so that you can take them home with your truck loaded with um, chairs and you can just take them down to the pier in the morning. Six, six o'clock here at St. James on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. We need all the men that we can possibly muster up. Um, the women did their turn back when they were at the tomb, first of all. So it's now the men's turn. <laughs> We need you to come and load up and unload. Um, breakfast will start when all the chairs come back from the pier. So once again, we need you guys to load all the chairs back up. Uh, Matt's looking for some help um, on getting all the audio stuff um, working. So any young ones that want to help learn all that stuff. I'm trying to find my notes. Um, I need people to serve on Easter Sunday. Free breakfast for all, so please bring your families and tell your neighbors all about that. Um, and I think that's all I've got on, on Easter, but next week is Palm Sunday. We are looking for someone who lives close by that might have some palm trees in their yard. So Mike and I need to come down and, and grab a couple of branches. If you know, if you've got some, just come and see me afterwards. And anyone that wants to help us um, put palm trees branches up. Depending on March Madness, we'll be here either Friday or Saturday. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. And Trevor? Hey, just uh, wanted to keep everybody informed. The retreat? Yes, we still need people to sign up for the retreat. It's your retreat. Sign up. So uh, people are going to be asking you personally. Please come and sign up. We need, we need more people to go. We would love the whole church to go. I will make arrangements if everybody wants to go. I will get you a place to stay. No problem. So please sign up. So we had a retreat meeting. We, we did some planning. We've got, we got uh, a little bit more stuff to do to make sure that everything flows smoothly. But the retreat's just around the corner. So please sign up. If you haven't, you need to. Um, the other thing is, we have a lot of things going on in our church. Um, committees. If you're not on a committee, please look into joining one of the committees. That's a, a real good way to help manage our church. If, if you don't know what the committees are, next week I'll make sure that we have a list of all the committees that really need help. So uh, I, I'm engaging you to get more involved with our church. We have a lot going on. There's a lot of information. I mean... I often feel that I'm one of the most uh, uninformed persons in the church. And I get tons of information every day. So um, if you don't know what's going on, I, I, I'm, I'm challenging you to get engaged to, to help our church grow so that we can reach out into the community and really start bringing these people, not just into our church, but, but to God. So, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Trevor. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that's most of our announcements. Oh, it's Purple Bucket Sunday. Okay, so for those not familiar, Purple Bucket Sunday is LWML, Luther Women's Missionary League. They raise these funds to give to missions. They supported all of their missions that they had, uh, said that they were going to support this year. I don't know the amounts. I mean, like into the millions of dollars, and they took care of them. And it's a wonderful thing that they, they're doing here locally and also internationally. And St. James is a big, big element in our, our local sunshine zone. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you for your generosity. It really, really helps. Okay. We'll rise then and go to prayer. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the word which passed between preachers and hearers this day. Set the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs offered as praise. Give ear to our prayers and strengthen all who feast at your table. And Lord, bring us close to your cross, that we might know how you loved us and gave yourself for us, 
we would keep Lent, Lord, in a way that is pleasing to you and keep your commandments. As we follow you from the garden to Calvary, do not let us follow afar off lest we deny you. Help us watch and pray with you that we may not fall into temptation. Enlighten us that we may see by faith that you knelt in prayer for us, that you, the Holy One, were judged a criminal by unholy men for us, that you suffered the whiplashes of angry sinners as our sinless Savior, that you stumbled under the cross as our suffering servant, that you died as the Lamb of God in our stead and for our sake. Lord Jesus, through it all, help us here in your prayer the single purpose which you endured pain and death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our Sunday school. We ask you to bless and enlarge the program and encourage our teachers and helpers. Ch children's time in church and Sunday school is so short. May they learn your word well in the time we have together and that they may be familiar, firmly rooted and grow to become mature believers in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We pray also for families of Marlene Keyes, Leroy Amundsen, and Reverend uh, Kenneth Klaus. Uh, for Fox and Millie and Justin and Irma. For Peter and Kurt and Carl. And Mark and Tina and Linda and Susan. For Carol Ann and Mike and Ann. For Richard's sister Sandy. For Sandy and... Michael and Nancy and Tony and Daniel, Maddie and Zoe. For Vesta, Nasreen, Judy, Diane, Edie, Joy and Ken. For Jim and Quinn and Patsy. For Violet and Gary. For Miguel and Maria and Bill. For Joel, Luca and Dave, Doug and Joanna. For Sevi and Matt, Joshua and Dewey. Daniel, Rudith and Eliana. Lisa, John and Bonnie and Elizabeth and Alec and Tim and Vicki and Marsha. And Roger and Michael and Abraham and Jim. For Dorothy, Pat, Bill, and Willie. And dear Heavenly Father, diseases, sicknesses, injuries, physical disabilities, and death were not what you intended for mankind. Hear the prayers of your people when they cry to you in pain and distress. If it pleases you, heal them or uphold them by your mighty hand. And we look forward to the day of your son's return when all things will be made new. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We pray also for Bill Keys. J.D. Zabel, Vicki Goins, and John Craigie, whose birthdays are this week. May your children also remember the new birth given through holy baptism. Grant health and all spiritual blessings throughout the coming year. Graciously bless and keep your servants always in your loving care. In the name of Jesus, in name we pray. Amen. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right, and, truly right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal and faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and singing. Holy.